I grew up in Bolton, in uh, what's now Greater Manchester. I think that it was probably Greater Manchester then, or were we still proudly Lancastrian? I'm not sure. Uh, so I grew up in Bolton, which was a good town to grow up in because it was kind of big enough uh, to feel like, you know, not everybody knew your business. It wasn't like village life and it wasn't isolated like country life. It was big enough, uh, you know, that there was the bands came to like Bolton Tech on a Friday and Saturday night and we could go and watch. It always seemed to be someone like Hawkwind or Gong or Amon Duel or someone, um, you know, someone from the kind of, um, you know, the low countries with 17 people in the group, you know, all wearing long kind of woolly hats and things. And um, I lived uh, in, in quite a nice house, a big sort of detached house walking distance from the school on Albert Road it was called Lanacost named after Lanacost, Lanacost Priory which I think is in uh, Northumberland and uh, it was a corner house with a like you know it had a little sort of turret room it was incredibly grand I don't really I, I, you know I don't quite know where we found the money from for it because we'd grown up in like um, a normal little semi-detached house and we moved from there to, um, to this big house, Lanacost, and uh, it, it seemed like a mansion, really. I think my mum and dad paid 14 grand for it. <laughs> Across a little landing where the, the house uh, cold water tank was, um, was my bedroom, which again was very small. It wasn't big enough to have a um, wardrobe in it. The wardrobe was stuck on the uh, turn of the stairs. And, uh, but I had this, um, this little room which had a single bed in it and a record player and a chest of drawers and a bookshelf and that was kind of it really. Um, and um, you know, again, a couple of posters on the wall which I think um, one might have been Olivia Newton-John which wasn't to my musical taste, but was kind of to everybody's taste in girls, if you were that sort of age. And the other one was a poster of uh, one of the frontest pieces done by Alfred Bestall of the Rupert Annuals. Because I've always been a massive Rupert the Bear fan since being a kid, and it's always been kind of part of Christmas, the Rupert Annual. And I still get the Rupert Annual for Christmas off my eldest daughter uh, to this day. <laughs> The first music that I heard that I thought, wow, this is absolutely for me, would have been David Bowie, you know. We had heard a couple of years before that, so 74 we get into kind of what, Aladdin Sane sort of time and everything. So the, the Bowie albums would have been on constant play. Um, some of the, um, uh, and so yeah, I, sp I suppose glam was always about the big singles on top of the pops really. So Slade albums were never really a thing. Apart from Slade Alive, their live album, which is a big Scout Hut disco favourite. T-Rex, I mean, you know, they, they were out before, just before uh, 74, but the um, Electric Warrior and the Slider were just like massive albums. Everybody had those. You know, they, uh, I was a big fan, bizarrely, I don't really know when, I was a big fan of The Strobes, who, uh, who, who kind of went through some kind of glam folk odd thing and I, I was really into that so things like Grave New World and Bursting at the Seams and Hero and Heroine um, I played those albums a lot and also things like um, you know the prog rock stuff so Dark Side of the Moon which we, again they've kind of been out a year by 74 The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway and Foxtrot by Genesis and things like that <laughs> I think I've been sort of um, a serial monogamist, really. So even from being quite young, I had quite long-standing girlfriends, you know. So my first girlfriend, who I think it had probably come to an end by this time, was uh, Hilary Wardle, you see. But she lived on the other side of town, up near Dunsker War Memorial. So it involved, like, two buses, one into Bolton and one out the other side. Um, and so she was at the same school as me, but it became a bit problematic. And, um, and so... That kind of foundered really, but then um, I had the uh, very good sense to uh, hook up with Zoe Thompson, 
who I'm still friends with to this day, and she lived right round the corner. She lived opposite uh, Charles Winder, who was my English teacher at school, who still lives in the same house now. And the, the next door neighbour was Charlie Wright, who was the goalkeeper for Bolton Wanderers. This was still in the era when footballers lived a normal life amongst us mere mortals and not in, you know, behind their electric portcullises in their um, you know, massive marble palaces and so Zoe Thompson lived around the corner and so we would actually meet up um, you know uh, after school and things you know before we did our own work or after and things like that and uh, in fact she used to buy me records for my birthday and I can still kind of picture her walking around the corner with uh, Next by Alex Harvey uh, sort of wrapped up for my birthday present because I was a big fan of Alex Harvey around that time as well. And, uh, and she, was, uh, she was very beautiful, and she still is, and, and uh, yeah, she lived right round the corner, and we were kind of uh, inseparable for a very long time, really. Or it seemed a long time, of course. I think it lasted into me going to university, and she was a year younger than me, so it probably lasted kind of three years, which, you know, when you're 16, is, is, is quite a big deal, really. The cheesecloth shirt was very big. And it was very tight, actually. In fact, all shirts were very tight. In you know, your dad's shirts were very tight. In fact, I've been rather grateful as I've sort of uh, got older and reached middle age myself that the, 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 the these tight things have not been such a big deal, you know, because everybody, as they got a bit older and the paunch expanded a bit, was still forced into really tight shirts with big collars from stolen from Ivor and shops like that. But we did have a very tight cheesecloth shirt, which uh, that kind of, you know, washed kind of muslin is it, I guess. I don't really know. And I still kind of see those shirts occasionally. I still like them. You know, I still think, oh yeah, cheesecloth shirt. That looks really good, you know. I think it's, as part of it stemmed from all those great pictures from the 60s where, you know, um, it seemed that all the blokes who were at Woodstock were kind of just hairy hobbits, you know, kind of fumbling around in the mud. And all the girls you saw a picture of were these willowy beauties in cheesecloth smocks, you know. And, and they would seem to hang around with these hobbitish blokes. And, and, and that gave you cause for hope, you know. You'd probably have a denim jacket, but over the top of that, you would have uh, either a big hairy um, Afghan coat. Do you know what I mean by that? Those suede coats with the fur and no, no arms in them. Oh, they could have arms in them, I think. Maybe the waistcoats had no arms and big long things. But my sister had one of those, and so it looked a bit girly to me. So I went with uh, what everyone else had, which was an, old, an army surplus great coat. So you would have a massive coat. And then, you know, you would, um, when you went to the Nocturne or you went somewhere to a gig, you would, like everyone else, take your great coat off and throw it into the broom cupboard or on the floor or whatever. And, and as often as not, uh, come home and wake up the next morning and realise that it was someone else's coat. It was almost like a proto scheme like the white bicycles in Amsterdam, really. It's kind of Bolton's army surplus great coat. It was like a communal supply. And, uh, and, and they were all minging and they all stank, and especially when wet. And, and they were all much too big. You know, you didn't know, it was, uh, because it, we, were, we were sort of, you know, callow youths. We, we, we were, um, you know slender people and, 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 and tiny, so the, all the coats were too big, so none of them really fitted, so it didn't really matter which coat you had, you know. Occasionally you would bump into someone over a pint of cider in the man and cider and say, I think that's my coat. So yeah, I might be, well, give me that one then. And you'd swap them out and they'd uh, toddle off into the night with their coat back. Well, Monty Python was still on, and that was kind of, that felt very much like, because we felt ourselves, even at that age, I think, to be, you, you kind of knew you weren't part of the mainstream, in a way, musically or whatever. You felt you were on the left field of things, even at that age, I think, and the music we were listening to, and the bands we were playing, and the music we were making ourselves. And Monty Python were the sort of, the, the super group of, of comedy, really. They were the kind of Pink Floyd or Genesis of comedy. So you had Top of the Pops, which was a kind of family thing. Every family I knew watched Top of the Pops Thursday night. And um, I remember, you know, watching it and really just hoping that there was going to be someone like Deep Purple or someone on, and occasionally there was, or Status Quo doing Paper Plane or something like that. Um, and the glam bands were always great fun. It was like, you know, all the kind of mud and sweet and all those things, T-Rex and Slade and uh, Roy Wood and Wizard and all those guys. That was always very colourful. And I think it was kind of important that it was... Um, Life in many ways was a bit monochrome still in those days, I think, you know, and there were power cuts and, and winters of discontent and things like that. So, so this blaze of kind of energy and fun and colour that came out from Top of the Pops, which has become a bit 
toxic and tarnished now with Jimmy Savile and all those things. And you think, yeah, well, it was all very well, but what was going on to some of these kids behind the scenes? But back then, of course, you know, we, well, until recently, we had no idea about all that. And so it was this blaze of colour that came out. Uh, the other thing, of course, you had, we had, uh, there was Pan's People, who became Legs and Co. You know, and for the for the uh, you know the adolescent male with limited exposure to girls dancing in the knickers. You know, it was a, it was a tonic and no mistake. I'll be honest with you, it was it was a Philip. I was at Bolton School, which at that time it was still there. It's an independent school now. It was a direct Grant Grammar School. It was called at the time. Quite an imposing thing. It's a big sandstone school on, on Chorley New Road in Bolton, quite a nice building. I found myself kind of, um, when I was a, a bit younger than this, sort of as a misfit, sort of didn't, because I wasn't really great at football and because, I don't know, my mum always said she was worried about me because I didn't seem to have friends, really. And I wasn't particularly aware of that. And I think that maybe she was right and, and that maybe, um, I wasn't bullied or anything. I wasn't, I didn't feel in the need of people, but maybe, in retrospect, the length of those relationships with those early girlfriends was a sign that I hadn't really found my place amongst my, you know, my peers kind of thing. And the eureka moment really was when I saw on telly um, the Monkeys, who they played in a group. I was already playing the drums, and uh, they played in a group, and they wore matching shirts and went places in a big car and had adventures. And uh, people seemed to like it. And even girls seemed to be quite impressed. And I thought, well, that looks to be a bit of a no-brainer, really. And once I formed a band, that became my gang. And it was great because it wasn't a club where people said, well, you can't do it like that. We don't play football like that. We don't play cricket like that. We don't, you know, it, it, it was like you could make your own rules up. And I thought, this is amazing. <laughs> I never expected to be doing any DJing. I was, I was, oh, I knew I was going to be the drummer in a massive band. That was what I was going to do. So you know, all the way through um, doing A levels after this, and then going on to university here in Manchester, I didn't really take any of it. I, I, I took it seriously because I was doing an English and American literature degree, and I was always read lots, and so I was. I wanted to read it, you know, and I wanted to learn. And, uh, but it was all going to be irrelevant because as soon as it finished, I was just going to be off on the first of many world tours. And so, you know, I was kind of perfectly relaxed that this was going to happen. And it was only when, uh, the, you know, I graduated at 21 when it looked like, oh, hang on a minute, you know, I might have to think of some alternatives here, you know. And uh, I mean, I, I was just so sure it was going to happen. You know, one of the jobs I looked for, uh, I went for an interview for, was a, an interview with Avery, who made scales for shops. And the reason I went to do that is because you got um, a company Opal Cadet Estate car, and I could get me drums in that. And honestly, I, that was how shallow I approached it. And I think that that's, um, even though I've been kind of serious about the things that I've done, I've never really had any overarching master plan. And I, and I think that when I look back on my, Later teenage years, you know, I had, a, I had a girlfriend, I was in a band and everything, and like, you know, so I just used to, if there was a day where things were rough with my parents or something had happened at school, I didn't really get in much trouble, you know, I mean, it, it is, uh, you know, in many ways it is quite a dull story, you know, and uh, I've always tried to tell my wife there are worse things to be than boring, you know. And so I thought, you think I've just shrugged my shoulders and go, oh, whatever, you know, I'll go and play my drums or listen to a record or go to a gig in town or whatever, you know, I don't, I don't recall, I don't recall being um, traumatised by, by much when I was 16 at all.